Hello, everyone, and welcome to this talk about high throughput clinical proteomics and applications to COVID-19. My name is Philip Geier, and I'm a plasma proteomics enthusiast and also the chief scientific officer of Omic Error Diagnostics. So I also want to give some words about Omic Error. So we are a young tech startup that have the big mission to improve health by proteomics, and we want to do this by finding new and even better biomarkers than the one that's available today and by also enabling our clients to do this. Um, we have a strong focus on uh, automation of the proteomics pipeline and also on software. And here we also strongly support open source software such as OmniClearn and AlphaPept. But now let's get started with plasma proteomics and why we should analyze the plasma proteome. So the blood and therefore also its liquid component, the plasma, are flowing through all of our organs. And on its way through our body, they can collect all kinds of information in the form of proteins. And these proteins are then a reflection of our health and disease state. And of course, we also know this is the case. And these are some data from the clinics from 9 million lab tests where they made a survey. And actually, in this clinic, 77% um, of all clinical decisions, they are based on some kind of a lab test. And... It is also, as a proteomics researcher, very reassuring to see that actually uh, proteins have the largest share of all the analytes that are measured in the clinic. However, there's also one issue, and this is that um, most of the current protein biomarkers are quite old. And um, the rate of introduction of new biomarkers, it's also very slow, and we are still missing biomarkers for the majority of all diseases. And this is despite the fact that we can get actually even with very short measurements, like five minutes uh, measurements, a quite comprehensive information profile out of plasma. So, for example, you would instantly see um, the gender of a person. You will see if someone is pregnant or taking the contraceptive pill. You will get also a quite a detailed reflection of the inflammation system of an individual. We're also covering the famous C-reactive protein, but then additionally, uh, 30 inflammatory proteins. We cover the complete lipid homeostasis system, including many risk factors for cardiovascular diseases. We even can see by protein glycation site if someone has non-treated diabetes, and we can get some uh, orthogonal readouts, for example, by uh, uh, getting information on alleles. And in total, we would cover in such very short measurements around 50 to 60 FDA-approved biomarkers. So we can definitely get a lot of information out of uh, just a droplet of blood. But then, of course, there's the question, what about uh, new biomarkers? And some years ago, we made a calculation to show that there is actually a huge potential to find new biomarkers. And we calculated that in the first 1,000 highest abundant proteins, there might be around 150 uh, new biomarkers. Nevertheless, the search for biomarkers was not very successful in mass spectrometry-based proteomics so far. And this has several reasons. One is, of course, the high dynamic range of the plasma proteome, but there are other reasons that are as strong. For example, the um, variation of the plasma proteome. Uh, this is some experiments that uh, we made. So we first uh, tried to get an idea about the technical variability. Uh, this means we prepared the same sample on several days and calculated the coefficient of variations of all the proteins. And here we saw that a uh, high-end mass spectrometry-based proteomics workflow can be very reproducible, and 71% of our proteins have a CV below 20%. And the CV below 20% is always very good, so this is in the range of many clinical applied tests. But then we also want to include some biology. So this intra-individual variability, this means, um, in this case, I pricked myself 10 times a day for 10 days in the fingers and calculated the uh, CV over time. And here you also see that actually most plasma proteins have, even over time, um, a quite low CV. However, it's getting complicated if we include now different individuals and calculate the inter-individual variability. So just a minority of all the proteins um, have low CVs here. And what does this mean? This means that the plasma proteome is relatively stable in a person over time. Uh, but it has a high variation um, within a cohort of several individuals. And um, this uh, let us make two conclusions. The first is, um, in a case and control comparison, we always have to go to very large-scale uh, cohorts. And this will be true for almost all diseases. 
And the second option is that we have is to go for longitudinal uh, cohorts where each individual can serve its, its own uh, control over time. But then again, you would have for each individual um, several samples, and this results again in large-scale cohorts. So I'm convinced that going to large-scale cohorts is really the um, uh, like the solution um, to um, deal with the high variability of plasma proteins. But to move to large-scale cohorts, you have actually also fulfilled quite a number of requirements that uh, comes with this large-scale cohorts. For example, you have really to control your processes. You have to control for it from sample entry until um, the acquisition of the results and also the delivery of the results. Uh, the sample preparation workflow uh, should be, in the best case, completely automated to get it very reproducible. And of course, you need a um, mass spectrometer system that's very robust, even over a long time period. And uh, we use here only the uh, Pruka uh, Tims of Pro instruments, uh, which allows us actually to measure uh, cohorts with thousands of samples without any issues. Um, what's also very good if you have um, trustworthy and very strong clinical collaboration partners that can supply you with fantastic cohorts. And of course, if you're acquiring such data amounts, you need quite a number of um, bioinformatic tools that can deal with this data. So we have here also a very strong focus on machine learning and also on databases. Um, where I'm a big fan of and a big advocate is actually this uh, quality control that I mentioned before. And uh, this also has a reason. So you really have to control for all processes in your hand. But what you can't control, you should still try to keep under control. And this is pre-analytics. So usually we as proteomic researchers don't collect our own samples. Um, hence, we quite strongly depend on our collaboration partners. Still, it is very important that we try to get also at this point under control and we published some time a study on contamination markers. So in principle, we went into literature. Um, we are looking in 276 uh, publications and we're writing down all the biomarkers that we found in there. And interestingly, 50% of all the studies reporting biomarkers report the same proteins. And some of the names made us suspicious, so we designed some experiments. We invited 20 uh, study participants, took their blood, separated the blood in its main compartments like erythrocytes, platelets, plasma, and we also compared plasma and serum. And then we're coming up with three different so-called contamination marker panels that indicate erythrocyte lysis, platelet contamination, and coagulation. And the idea is that you also apply these contamination marker panels to your study. For example, and back to one of our um, previous uh, studies, it's a weight loss study. And now you can instantly see which samples um, were contaminated. For example, this case, uh, plasma samples that suffered from partial coagulation. And you could now just exclude these uh, samples from your study. You also should check for systematic bias. Um, and this is relatively easy. You do a simple case control comparison and plot one of these famous volcano plots. And then you highlight one quality marker panel after the other. For example, in this study, we see that all the platelet markers, they're in one arm of the volcano plot. And this means you have a systematic bias here. So usually would be happy uh, that you have outlier proteins. But in this case, they are actually just um, contamination markers. And uh, they are the result of uh, differences in uh, pre-analytical sample processes. Still, you might be happy because you have uh, two more proteins. But he here, I would recommend you to also evaluate these uh, candidate proteins. And you can do this by a global correlation map. Uh, and then you do a simple lookup. For example, you have a look where this protein is clustering. And then you see, for example, it's clustering in the platelet panel. This means it's not a new biomarker. It is uh, just also due to um, pre analytical processing issues, but the other protein is clustering somewhere else, so you can still follow up this protein. And this is uh, very crucial um, to follow this uh, process. I also wanted to talk about a previous study that we published. It is on COVID-19. And the idea here was to describe the alteration of the plasma proteome during uh, this disease. And all the um, pathobiological results are published on MedArchive, so you can uh, have a look here. And we also published our app note together 
with uh, Ruka. And this describes all the technical details of the study. So please also have a look here. And now I want to quickly guide you through some of the results and show us some advantages and disadvantages of the study design. So here is CRA, the study. It consists of uh, COVID-19 patients, of course, and then also on uh, controls. And these are actually fantastic controls because these patients, they showed COVID-19-like symptoms, but were PCR negative. So they're fantastic controls. But if you have a look now in the COVID patient, you also see one of the disadvantages. If you would compare now cases and controls to each other, you see there's quite an imbalance. And usually I would also say like 31 patients is quite uh, underpowered for most of the diseases here in COVID, we have a super strong response and see still significant outliers. But um, in, in general, it would be a quite small cohort. Nevertheless, there's also one advantage to this arm of the study. And this is that we have very uh, highly detailed longitudinal profiles of these patients. So we have a very nice longitudinal study with on average 15 time points. And then you can draw very nice uh, trajectories and you can also confirm differences between cases and controls. Um, and actually, also the Eurebios made us to do this comparison between cases and controls. And we have done this by um, a machine learning model. And as you can see here in the uh, rock curve, we get an, an, an area under the curve of uh, 0.9, which is actually quite good. And this would mean, for example, that of uh, the COVID patients that have COVID patients, we could detect 87%. Uh, which is quite nice, but of course, in a disease like COVID, you always want to detect 100% because otherwise they will just infect other individuals. But still, this would uh, work in general. And uh, we used for this uh, prediction uh, Omic Learn, which is an open source platform, uh, as I mentioned before. So please also go to omiclearn.com and there you can just apply machine learning very easily to your own uh, cohorts. Uh, as I said before, the beauty of the study is actually the longitudinal uh, uh, design, and we can do various tests here to discover proteins that are changing during disease. Um, and actually, we saw that a quarter of all proteins were significantly uh, changing in COVID-19. And this also includes uh, new potential biomarkers uh, for COVID-19 detection. And we even found one uh, protein, this ITIH4, which is a potential pro perspective marker for COVID-19 mortality. And this was actually now also already confirmed in uh, other studies. So if you have now this uh, group of uh, proteins that are significantly altered in a disease, you can do some more analysis, give you some more information. For example, you can do one of these uh, longitudinal plots of the average um, patient and can just cluster the proteins with the same trajectories together. In this case, we saw, for example, this first cluster where super sick patients are coming to the hospital and then they're getting healthier over time. Then you see that, for example, the innate immune system is uh, first up and then it's downregulated uh, over time. And the second cluster is actually uh, the most interesting one almost, and it contains a lot of proteins of the coagulation system. And here's important to note that uh, problems with the coagulation system are actually the main complication in COVID-19. And we hope that we also found some potential new uh, treatment options in these uh, proteins. And the last cluster, it's uh, usually seen by our community as uninteresting because it contains immunoglobulin regions. But in this case, it's very interesting as in all other uh, infection diseases because we can really track on a patient-specific level the development of antibodies and then we all see if a patient is getting really immune against uh, COVID-19. Yeah, that's it actually already about this um, presentation, maybe a short summary. So I hope I could show you that there is actually a potential to find new biomarker with mass spectrometry based proteomics. But still, a uh, requirement is that we go to large-scale cohorts. I can recommend you here the rectangular strategy and longitudinal study designs. And always uh, have a look on your uh, sample uh, quality with this contamination marker panels. And now I also want to say, uh, of course, uh, thank you to all of our collaboration partners. And of course, to you that you are listening to this talk. So thank you very much.